Okay, take your Bible this morning and turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We are continuing to talk about this would be the ninth lesson in this series, The Just Shall Live by Faith. And I'll tell you, I, you, you think about these things because <clears throat> this is the way our, if, if you believe the gospel, if you've rested in Christ as the Lord your righteousness, this is the only way you can live. You can't live by sight. Now you can't. And you cannot, you'll drive yourself absolutely stark raving mad if you try to live by feelings and emotion and sentiment because they're so easily distracted, so easily destroyed, so easily uh, put in a place of worry and anxiety and fear. We have to, as, uh, as justified saints, those who have been given full, free, eternal justification through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have been completely sanctified, declared, set apart as holy to be used for God's glory, who are guaranteed based on God's express promise to be glorified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our privilege, I almost said duty, but it's our privilege to live trusting and believing the God who's made the promises. And that's what we're seeing here in this 11th chapter. You know, there, Paul has told them salvation in its entirety has no conditions on the sinner. And these people, these Hebrew believers, had been, had been uh, approached and had been uh, troubled and tormented by friend, family, and foe that they didn't have the things that were necessary for eternal life. At this time, we know the temple still stood. The Jews were still going through all the rituals and routines. And they looked at these Hebrew believers who had professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and identified with the, that which was called the way through believers' baptism and identified with the church of God. And now they tell them, that, the, and this would, be, this would be hard to deal with, if your mother or your father, or a grandmother, or a grandfather, or a sibling came to you and told you, look, I, I know we believe a little different than you do. Yeah. But we're still trying to get to the same place. But then if they turn around and told you with what you're doing and what you're saying, you don't have a you don't, and this is what was being said there. You don't have a tabernacle. You don't have a temple. You don't have a priest. You don't have a sacrifice. You don't have all the ceremonies. You don't have a rule of life. You don't have any of these things. Why don't you come back over here where you have all these things? Well, in reality, the exact opposite was true. These people who were pushing this false narrative, they had no temple they had no high priest they had one down here but at this time folks you think about what's already occurred when our Lord Jesus Christ died what happened to that temple and everything that was involved with it the veil was rent in two it was done the glory had departed God wrote Ichabod over all that and yet the Jews, because they, they thought that there was salvation in those things, they continued to do those things. And I'm telling you, people in religion are like a bunch of mindless robots. They just do what they have been programmed to do, what mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa told them was right, what all them old preachers that they had sat under all their lives, that they respected and liked and enjoyed their delivery and the, the way they were so so friendly and kind and outgoing and played softball and you know, did everything that made them feel comfortable, they buy into that narrative that somehow something that the sinner does or something that's done in the sinner or through the sinner is what makes the difference between life or death. And Paul, the writer of Hebrews will have none of it. He says what? There's salvation only one place. There's only one way sinners are perfected forever. 
There's only one great high priest. There's only one true tabernacle, one true temple. And everything that went before, what did it do? It pointed to him who was the fulfillment of all of it. But yet these Jews, we're going to go back and we're going to do all of this. Still going down to the tabernacle, offering sacrifices. I'll never forget, years ago, it's been a long time ago, my brother-in-law called me up. Went to a little small Baptist church in Belmont, Louisiana, and they had a young preacher, and it was getting close to Easter time. And he called me up and told me that their preacher for Easter time wanted to sacrifice a lamb. Now, you think about that. Even symbolically. Number one, Pete ought to get involved in that if we go killing the lamb at a church. But number two, why? The blood of bulls and goats cannot, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin. A sheep too. A turtle dove too. And yet these Jews think that that's what makes a difference. And some of them have gone back. And so the writer of Hebrews is bringing forth evidence upon evidence, example upon example, of sinners just like them. That's the thing we have to keep in mind. Everybody that's listed here in this hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, they are sinners, fully worthy in and of themselves of nothing but condemnation and alienation and separation from God based on their best performances. But they were all sinners who by God's grace, he had revealed Christ, the Messiah, the promised seed, the seed of the woman, the one that they'd all been looking for from the very beginning. I don't know about you, but I think about that often. You know, they, which, which came first? <clears throat> huh? Huh? Did the sinner come first or did the surety come first? Well, I tell you what, ain't none of us, pardon the bad English, ain't none of us eternal in our, of ourselves. But he, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever Christ is now in glory, Kenny, what was he in eternity past? He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And I think about that all the time. Listen, if if there had not been a surety standing to represent his people, when Adam fell in the garden, God would have damned the whole thing right then. He would have obliterated. He'd, He'd been forced to because of his absolute holiness and his justice. But God could show mercy to the, to the, he was the chief of sinners at that time. Him, him and his wife Eve, they were the only sinners. But God showed mercy to the chief of sinners. Why? One stood for him. One in the fullness of time was going to come into this world, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were what? In Adam. Guilty by nature. Even by practice. And so we left off last Sunday. We dealt with Abraham. And I tried to show you. I, I, don't, I, I hope and I pray that I was able to do so. That, that Abraham fully expected God to be faithful to his promise. Both in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. But Abraham's hope was not all relying upon that little plot of land. And those people that are his national lineage. His major hope was what? In that seed. That seed which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he trusted and fully expected God based on his promise. That he'd be faithful to his natural seed. And more importantly that he'd be faithful to his spiritual seed. Every single solitary one of them. And so we want to start this morning, we want to pick up, and we want to look at, at his wife, Sarah. Look at verse, verse 11 and 12. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, 
and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now get this, get this image in your head. Here's an old man, extremely old man, an extremely old woman, past childbearing. And our God, who had called out Abram out of Ur of Chaldea, a sinner, a stargazer like we discussed last Sunday, called him out to go to a land that he did not know. And, you know, when you go back and you look at the narrative, it took God twice to get Abraham to go, go where he was supposed to go. You know, he left, left Ur of Chaldea, and he just moved right across the border, but he didn't go where God told him. So God told him again, you got to get out of get leave the land of your fathers and go to the land that I've appointed you. And so he goes out, and along this trek, God makes a promise to this man. And what did he tell him? He carried him out and he told Abraham, if you look to the heavens, and that's what's referenced here in verse 12, you look to the heaven, if you can count the stars in heaven, you ever tried to do that? Go outside on a clear night and look up, start counting. He tells him, if you can count the stars in heaven, you can count the number of your seed. Not seeds, your seed. And he also told him, if you can count the sand, you ever picked up one handful of sand? Just count one handful. But he says, if you can count the sand which is by the seashore, you can count your, your seed. And he told him, he said, you're going to have a child in your old age. <laughs> and Abraham's like, yeah, I'm, I'm old. I'm past. I, I can't. There's no way. My wife's old. My, one, of my, one of my servants is going to get everything that I've got. I think it was Eliezer was the name. Was the name that's the name that pops into my head. And Sarah heard this discussion. We, we're going to go there. Turn, turn over to Genesis chapter 18. Because it's amazing here in, in the hall of faith, Verse 11, it says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, let's, let's think about this. Look at Genesis chapter 18. Look at verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, she's in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. So she's sitting there listening, and she's hearing this conversation. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in years, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, what? She had already gone through menopause. She... She was done. This, the, I'm telling you, this is going to be a miracle. This is going to happen. It ain't going to be something she's going to be able to work up on her own. So she hears this. When, at the time appointed, I'm coming back, and she's going to bear a son. Now, our text in Hebrews 11 says she received strength to conceive, and she believed in him who, him who and he was faithful now, judged him faithful who had promised. Well, let's look here. Verse 12. Therefore, Sarah, what'd she do? She laughed within herself, saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? In other words, what, what is that? You know what that is? That's unbelief. That's not taking God at his word, right? And what is unbelief? That's what that see. That's that's the way you trap all these people to say, "Well, Christ died for all our sin. He died for all the sins of all the people." 
Okay? If he put away all sins, what's unbelief? It's sin. So did he die for all sin or just some sin? Did he put away all your sins? Because, listen, even as a child of God, are you always filled with perfect faith? Do you never go through periods of unbelief? Do you never at times as a child of God? Think about it. You think about what, what a, a slap in the face to a holy God who's made the promise, who the promise to us. What's the promise? This is the promise he's promised us. Eternal life. And yet, because of remaining sin and our sinfulness, if we go into certain things that some, and even, even as justified saints, we think some of them's worse than other ones, don't we? But we willfully go into some sin and we begin to think what? What's the first thought that pops into your mind when you sin against your God? I might not be a Christian. Let me ask you this. What made you a Christian to begin with? What part did you have in ever establishing that vital union? And I see people say, well, there you go. Yeah, we know. I, 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 I try not to use these big words, but I don't know of any other one. To, they say, we know you are an antinomian. You're against the law. No, we're not. But listen, we know the reality of who and what we are. We're sinners, and we cannot escape that fact. And so we get filled with doubt and uncertainty and worry and anxiety, and we think we might not be saved. Or we might think we've sinned enough. Boy, this is even more that we've sinned. We've gone too far. I think about Samson. That's who pops into my mind. Yet our Lord never left him nor forsook him. David was the same. Jonah in a whale's belly. In abstract rebellion against God. And yet what's he do? And that, that's what gets me about that. He's out there in the middle of an ocean in a whale's belly that the Lord has prepared to swallow him. People say, you people are lit Christian. Y'all don't actually believe it. It's in his book. God prepared that fish to swallow it. It's out there swimming around in the, in the, in the sea. And Abraham, and Noah, what, I mean, Jonah, it says he turns his face toward the temple. Now you tell me how you figure that out in the middle of the Dead Gum Sea in the be belly of the whale. And what does he do? He prays and he calls him, my God. Praise him to his God. You can't get much further away from God than in the depths of the sea in a whale's belly. But by this same faith that we're talking about this morning, what does he do? He looks to him who's faithful to his promise. Right? And so this woman, she hears this promise, and she doesn't, she, she laughs. Why does she laugh? Because when she first hears it, you know what she's not doing? She doesn't consider who made the promise. Huh? But here's the thing. She believed when she first considered him whom is faithful, the one who made the promise. Paul stated it this way, and he stated it correctly. He said, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless... I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I, I tell you, I can remember in false religion, I, I would add one little word into that sentence, say, that it's just not there. 
I, I would read into it, and I think most of our religious friends and family, people we know, they read it in there too. They, for, for I know whom I have believed in. It don't say that. It said, you know who you believed. He said, I know who I believed. And since I know who I believe, what? A God who cannot lie. A God who, when he's made a promise, what's he faithful to keep the promise with no conditions on me? See, that's the thing. This thing of eternal life, no conditions on the sinner. None. Not your faith, not your repentance, not your sincerity, not your perseverance. It's God who made the promise. And he is able to keep you from falling, right? And present you to himself holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Which of any of that is dependent on something you do? You see that? He says, I know who I'm a believed, and since I know who I believed, what am I? I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. Now, you listen to me. Justified sinners believe the promise when, when they, just like this woman Sarah, consider all the perfections of God's character and his faithfulness and his power to fulfill the promise. You think about what we're called on to believe. We're called on to believe the promise because why? We know the God who made the promise. How do I know that I know the God who made the promise? He's told me I know him. Huh? <laughs> Because listen, if I don't know him, I don't have eternal life. Our Lord was very clear on this. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We're going to talk about that this morning in the worship hour. Saul of Tarsus was religious, moral, sincere, dedicated, right? He excelled and went beyond many in his own false faith, and he said of himself, even after conversion, that I exceeded all the other apostles before me. But when he was Saul of Tarsus, he, 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 would, if you had ran into Saul of Tarsus, or any of them back then, in, false, in, in what was the Judaistic faith, who would they tell you they were serving? Huh? It wasn't Buddha or Allah. They'd tell you real quick. And you know what the Jews in John 8 told our Lord? They said, we serve one God. Huh? They said, God is our God. And by God, they meant Jehovah. God is our Father. Our Lord looked at him and said, if God were your Father... And if Abraham were your father, what would you do? You'd do the works of Abraham. You'd do what? You'd believe on me. Why? Because you'd know there's no life other than where? In the sun. And the thing I know, turn back over to our text now. The thing I'd have you to notice in all this, God made this promise to Abraham and to his wife that they were going to have a seed. And that seed was going to be beyond imagination as far as innumerable is concerned. And yet, from the time that God made this promise, you think about all the sin and all the rebellion and all the idolatry and all the self-righteousness of the whole Jewish nation because you know, they, they start out, he has his son Jacob and Esau. No, Israel, he has Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Jacob has his 12 sons, right? They end up down in bondage in Egypt. As well as all the evil that was involved when they were down in, in Egypt with that Pharaoh that they dealt with. And yet all of it combined couldn't hinder God's promise. Just over 200 years, this is an amazing thing, just over 200 years 
75 people, because that's how many went down into Egypt. 75 people multiplied to how many? 600,000 men plus women and children. It don't give us a total. It said it was 600,000 men plus women and children. And you know, yeah, I've said this before. Those Jewish families had big families. I mean, you think about it. And they had, many of them had multiple wives. <laughs> but if they all just had one wife and say they all had five children, think how many 600,000 was there above 600,000. It's in the millions of people. So from one man, Abraham, though he was physically as good as dead, and his wife too, there sprang the descendants from those two whose number could not be counted. Not just there, but think about all the spiritual seed of national Israel, of, of, the, of the children of God, the true Israel of God. Now here's the next thing. Look, look at what we see next in verse 13. I'm going to talk about for the next several verses faith and assurance of our salvation. Look at verse 13, because we see here faith and confession. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, I want to state this as clearly as I can. And I make no apology about this. When it says these all died in faith, what's it talking about? How'd these folks die? They died in a state of justification before God. Listen, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Not his faith, what? The object of his faith. The person and work of the one promised, the promised seed. His righteousness was counted to him for righteousness. So what do we mean when they were justified? These, listen, Abraham died. You know where Abraham expected to go? Not to the grave. Where did he expect to go? He fully expected to go to heaven. Based on what? That he had been a good guy. Right? No, because he was a liar twice. That he tried, that he was sincere, always faithful, always a servant of the Lord. No, what did, what did he, what was his hope? Same hope you got. His hope was in a divine substitute. You say, those folks didn't, they didn't understand that. Go back and read the Old Testament. And then read the New Testament where our Lord confirmed in John chapter 8, Abraham, your father, longed to see my day. And listen, he saw it. What did he say? He saw Messiah coming. Let me ask you this. What are you looking back to? You seen him? You physically seen Christ? I'm not talking about that image that our grandmas and grandpas used to have on the wall, that, that good-looking GQ model with the long hair. That's not what I'm talking about. But if, you, if, if you're a child of God this morning, do you see him? Huh? Do you see? We, we're, we're looking back. I'm looking back right now, 2,000 plus years, to a point in time which our God called the fullness of time, that he sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem me out from underneath the guilt, penalty, and condemnation of God's law of justice. I cannot see it with my physical hands. I cannot eyes. I cannot touch it with my physical hands. I can read about it in this book, but I tell you, it's as real to me as you are sitting in front of me today. I know there was a God-man lived. Sin here of God. 
to do everything necessary that he, listen, he was my, he was my righteousness. He is my righteousness. That he would bear in his body all the guilt, all the penalty, all the condemnation of my sin. I mean, it's for all the elect of all the ages, but it's for me. Huh? He's the Lord, my right. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have not y'all, but who? Shall I have righteousness? Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength? See, he's the Lord, my righteousness. If you've blessed him, he's the Lord, your righteousness. And he reveals himself to us to say, is all we need, everything necessary, and all of it's according to the promise. But he says this of them. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now, the promises that he talks about here, they're, they're not regeneration and conversion and all that's included in those things. The promises here have to do, uh, they, they, they don't respect the land of, of Canaan, and they don't have anything to do with the Mosaic economy. If you go over and you look at verse 39, these all having obtained a good report through faith receive not the promise. The promises here in our text, verse 13 and in verse 39, what had they not received? What didn't happen in their generation? Huh? What was the promise? There's a seed coming. Huh? They hadn't. They, they didn't see the coming of Christ in the flesh. When he when he actually would satisfy all the conditions of their salvation, they didn't see it. But here's what we know: they saw his day. How? By faith. These all died in faith. You see that? And they were persuaded that what's going to happen. Even listen, when Abraham closed his eyes in death, he. Was he hopeless? No, would he know? There's one yet coming. Might not be, might not be in my son's time or my great grandchildren's time. It might be. It's going to be in, in whose time? In God's appointed time, right? And they actually embraced him, and they received his righteousness. And rested in his righteousness. It's promised this good hope through grace. Is the cause of their salvation. But they didn't live. That's, this is all this means. They did not live to witness his incarnation. His death. Or his resurrection. But what does it say? It said having seen them afar off. You see that? And were persuaded. And embraced. See, that's what that's what the faith of God's elect. That's that's the difference between me believing. That's what they, that's all they stressed to me all my life. You got to believe. You got to accept. You got to trust in Jesus. Call on Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Him into your heart. Got nothing to do with my belief. But I tell you one thing: this, this seeing afar off. And being persuaded and able to embrace, what are those all? What are every one of those th those actions? They're actions of the mind. The understanding. Where's God working his people? He told Isaiah, come now and let us reason together. What do you reason at? Not in my hands and my feet. I reason in my mind and my understanding. And these people expected that what's God going to do? God's going to be faithful to his promise. He's going to send his son. He's going to send him as the seed of the woman. And that seed of the woman that they'd been promised and were looking for, he was going to satisfy every single solitary condition of their salvation according to his promise, which turn back to chapter 6 real quick, Hebrews 6. That promise that God had confirmed that it was sure and certain, how? He swore. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was told all my life, you better not ever swear. And he, God tells us don't swear by anything on heaven or heaven on earth. But I tell you, if you've ever been to court one time, 
You ever been sworn into a jury? What did you have to do? Huh? They brought a Bible out there and put it in front of you, and they said, put your hand on the Bible, and what did you have to do? You swore an oath. Right? Why put your hand on the Bible? Because you swear by something that's greater than you. Well, notice what it says here. God, God has made an absolute promise. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. Here's the promise. For when God made promise to Abraham. Now what's God done? God's made a promise. What's the promise? The promise we've already been looking at for the last couple of weeks that Abraham knew about and Sarah knew about. Because he could swear by no greater. Now listen to this. He could swear by no greater. What did he do? He swore by himself. Saying, what's God's oath? What's he swear? Surely blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. You, you, who's all the emphasis on here? Not Abraham. It's on the God who's made the promise that has the ability, the power, and the willingness to fulfill the promise. I will bless thee. I will multiply thee. And so after he had <clears throat> patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them the end of all strife. In other words, if you swear to something, you know, we, we'll, we, you, know you swear to me. <laughs> and somebody swears, I swear on my mama. You know, I swear on my daddy. I swear on this. I, I, most of the time, unless they're just abstract liars, which most of the time they are liars anyhow, people will swear oaths that don't mean anything by it. We'll swear by anything and everything. But when they swear an oath, we say, well, that settles it. For men swear by greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all things, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the unchangeableness of his counsel. That's what that word immutability means. He confirmed it with an oath. That by two immutable things, what are the two immutable things? His counsel and his oath. Those are two things that when God purposes something, can't be changed. And when God swears that he's purposed something, what? It's done. That's how he can declare the end from the beginning. No slip-ups. No accidents. That hurricane that spun through down there the other day, I tell you what, who directed it? It, it tickled me, these people. They, they, they said, give more money, let's go more green, and we'll change the weather. Go ahead and try that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't change anything. Huh? And if it, if it appears to be changed, it wasn't really changed. What, it was God's purpose being accomplished. I can't explain that. I just know it to be so. That by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that's set before. How can we have confidence in this present evil world? The one who made the promise. Okay. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Why within the veil? Who's, who's within the veil? Huh? The forerunners entered. The one that we're heirs, joint heirs with. He's taken possession of everything already for us. Made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who? Even our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's, here's another, another thing. That's, that's true God-given faith. It's a confidence in what God has revealed. And it's not presumption. Because that, that that most people call presumption, what, what do they say? 
I, I've heard this statement made by men at one time I respected. They said, you cannot be too cocksure for heaven. Can't be too certain. I'm going to tell you what. These things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. I'm pretty certain that there was fear and doubt and anxiety when Noah was in that ark. He heard and felt everything. I've been on a cruise ship one time in my life. Once was enough. I don't need to do it again. But I'm so grateful that that big boat that I was on, when we got in those big seas coming back across the Gulf of Mexico, we were in 15-foot seas. I was grateful that that thing had what they call stabilizers on it to where it didn't rock as much as it did. And I had an advantage. I had a scopolamine patch on the whole time. But there were other people that weren't that fortunate. He didn't have any of that on that boat, that ark. That sucker was totally at the will and whim of the God who told him how to build it. Had no rudder, no steering wheel, no controls. 300 days floating around in a boat. Stuff hitting the boat. The thunder clouds. Kind of like when the children of Israel stood under that mountain and that smoke descended on that mountain and all they heard was thunder and lightning and it created fear in them. But folks, he was safe in spite of his unbelief and doubt because God had made the promise you're going to be safe and all your heirs are going to be safe inside of this boat. What they call presumption, which is full expectation of salvation, God calls what? These all died in faith, believing the promise. And they confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They were in the world, just like you and me. We're in the world, but what are we? We're not of the world. They had families, just like you and me. They had possessions. They had good times. They had bad times. They had prosperity and poverty. They had sickness. They had health. They had life and they had death, just like we do. All of them. They weren't a bunch of shiftless vagabonds. Nor were they totally uncertain about the things in this life. But you know what I know about them and I know about all God's children? They walk by faith, expecting salvation based on Christ and his righteousness alone, the promised Messiah. They didn't walk by sight trying to establish a righteousness of their own. None of them did. All men by nature know that this world is not the end. And we'll close with this this morning. All know Everybody knows that this life that we're going through, saved or lost, what do we know? We know it has a, a beginning when we were born, and we know it has an end when we die, and it's just a pilgrimage through it. And here's the thing. except Unless somebody's just an agnostic or a, a pagan, everybody desires to go to heaven. Now, they do. But it can't be separated from the promise. The repentance from former idolatry and dead works. Which is evident from what we're going to see when we get in verse 14 and 15. As verse 14 tells us, For they that say such things declare plainly, what are they looking for? They're seeking a country. And that's why the world doesn't know us. The world's in a state of condemnation before God. And justified sinners are strangers and pilgrims in this world just in that sense only. 
You think about it. We are, by, we, John said it best in 1 John 3. Now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we'll see him as he is. We'll come back next week and we'll pick up in verse 14. You're dismissed to worship our Lord.